Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue our study on Revelation 12, 13, and 17 in relation to Daniel's last vision. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this morning, once again, that we can come together and open your word. And we invite your spirit's presence into our hearts and into this study, into our midst. We know, Lord, that the things you have been showing us are not what we expected. And um, we're still uncertain about some things. But we know, Lord, that you lead. And we just pray that you can continue to guide and direct us in understanding the things we are studying. Um, be with each person in our personal struggles and walk with you. We know, Lord, that we can be discouraged when we look at ourselves, but we pray that we can uh, look to Christ for strength and help, and uh, that we cannot be deceived by our own feelings. Um, help us, Lord, to be led by your Spirit. Be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, again. So, um, we're going to finish off Revelation 12. Now, um, so we've drawn, drawn it on a line. We're going to look at that. Now we're going to start on Revelation 13, drawing this on a line. Now, the thing about Revelation 12 that, that we have focused upon is understanding this great red dragon. We've drawn that on a line. And we know that this is pagan Rome. It's pagan Rome on the 1843 charts. And the pioneers understood the seven heads to be seven forms of Roman government. There appears to be more than seven forms of Roman government. And, and I suggested yesterday that the 10 horns could be the first 10 emperors. Also, sometimes when you look at the total of the forms of government, you could actually come up with 10. And, um, so it is possible that maybe the 10 horns just represent the forms of government and the ten, seven heads represent the seven kings at the beginning. Um, the fact that there's seven crowns upon the heads of the great red dragon, to me would lend credence to that it's the seven kings of Rome that are referred to by the heads. Um, and uh, so when we look at, so I'm gonna switch here to the chart. So when we look at these first 10 emperors, uh, what we have is a list that begins with Augustus. That is, we're saying it's the first 10 emperors. But if we were to look at how we look at, um, let's say, the Persian kings, we know Cyrus is going to be the first Persian king. Darius is a Median king. But they are still both there. When we look at Reagan and Bush the first in the presidents of the United States, Reagan's going to line up with Darius the Mede, Bush the first with Cyrus. And so we have a time of the end um, where we have that um, existing. Now, as far as these first 10 emperors, where we're placing them, is we're not placing them at the time of the end here. We're not placing them back at 509 BC. We're placing them at the arrival of the second angel's message. So, so I, I don't really know how to, I, I don't think we can take these emperors in this illustration in Revelation 12 and line them up with the seven presidents, right? I mean, if we're going to be consistent with how we look at the time of the end, we wouldn't take this illustration to do that, but we can line up the emperors with um, the time of the end being in 1989, even though this Revelation 12 doesn't have that. I know we're just kind of jumping into this, but I hope people can see what, what, I'm, what I'm pointing out is that because we can put these things on a line, we have to, we have to be consistent with Millerite history and, and with how we understand these lines. And so uh, Revelation 12, we have these 10 emperors 
and we're starting with Augustus. But it doesn't mean that if that we couldn't look at these 10 emperors in another way. That is, we, we have already recognized that we can do a count uh, starting with Reagan, right? So when we start with Reagan as number one, what were we doing to start with Reagan as number one? instead of starting with Bush the first as number one. I know that's Revelation 17 we, we, we get into there. Oh. Reagan had looked to have a closer relationship with Rome. Right. So that's going to be related to the siege, or not the siege, the, I don't know why I said siege, uh, related to the, because I'm looking at the siege in 63 BC, I guess, um, related to uh, um the covenant or the agreement, what is it? The league, right? The league with right. Rome. Okay. So we can see that that Reagan is the one that makes the league. And and Jeff had pointed this out. And Stephen had mentioned, you know, about how Jeff had, had paralleled uh, Cyrus with um, uh, with Reagan, right? So we have all these inconsistencies about these kings, and these are the things that we're going to have to sort out as we get into Revelation 17 and try to understand the 10 horns and the seven heads and the seven kings where five are fallen and one is. We also have here the seven kings of Rome, and I'm saying that these seven kings of Rome may have some parallel in how to interpret the seven kings in Revelation 17. And in Revelation 17, we could count, because we have these seven kings, we normally would just count them from the time of the end, right? So we would we would count, you know, Cyrus is the first, right? Because that's how we've been doing it. But we also have a reason in which we could start earlier. Now, when the with these first ten emperors, we know that the first emperor is Augustus. But can we pair Augustus with Julius, just as we pair Darius the Mede with Cyrus? and Reagan with Bush the first. Do you understand what I'm asking? No. Okay, so at the time of the end with the th three decrees, we have two, we have Darius the Mede and Cyrus. Now Darius the Mede is, is technically the first Persian king. But, Correct. But we have Darius the Mede at the time of the end as well. He is actually the king when Cyrus conquers Babylon, when Babylon falls in 539. And we have these two dates. You know, we have the 539 date for the fall of Babylon ending the 70 years for Babylon or of Babylon. And then you have the 70 years ending with Cyrus coming to the throne and then six months later issuing the decree. And, and that is going to also be marked as the time of the end. In a sense, we have the same thing in 1989 as well with um, 1989 and 1991 for the fall of the Soviet Union. And we have a similar thing as well in 1798 and 1799 with the Pope uh, being taken captive and then finally his death while in exile. And we don't really have two different people there um, in 1798, as far as I know, uh, because we just have the Pope being taken captive. And I don't know, I'm not really sure how, how we would address that in 1798. That's always been a bit of a puzzle to me that we don't have two people being marked there. But, but be that as it may, we know that we can pair them together. Now, Augustus is technically the first emperor. Odilio in his studies tried to count from Julius Caesar. But if you, if you take into account that they in a sense are a pair, there's a transition that happens with the latter part of Julius Caesar's reign, even if it's just you know maybe the last year or whatever, that's pointing towards him becoming an emperor um, even though he's not technically the first emperor. And then Augustus is going to be the first emperor. But they are sort of paired together. 
And the question is, is it possible to take those 10 horns in the great red dragon and say that they start with Julius Caesar and end with Vespasian in the year, because Vespasian is the one who is the emperor when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. And so that the count of the 10 horns could be counted differently. The thing about counting with Julius Caesar is we don't get uh, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius as being 666. Nero, of course, would end up being the sixth if we started with Julius Caesar. Five have fallen, Neo is, Nero is the one there. And then uh, Otho, Vitellius, uh, or Gaba, Otho, and Vitellius would be seven, seven, and seven. And then you would have the 10th one being Vespasian, right? Uh, hopefully people can understand what I'm getting at here. It's just that I've tried to look at it both ways and see which one makes the most sense. And maybe later when we get into Revelation 17, we can address that again. So all I'm trying to say about Revelation 12 is we have these seven kings and they may have some parallel to the seven presidents of the United States at the end, if we're going to apply those seven kings to presidents of the United States, there could be parallels there. But then also, how do we count those seven presidents is, is another issue. Do we start with Reagan as one, which is what um, Colin has done, or do we start with Bush the first as number one, right? You're going to see what we're going to run into. And we run into the same problem with the emperors as well. So, so I just wanted to, to, to talk about that idea, just to say that we're going to be looking that, at that in more detail when we get to Revelation 17. So what we have here is a tentative line that seems to make sense. It seems to answer a lot of the questions that we've had and address many of the problems and inconsistencies that we've seen. It does abandon the pioneer view as far as the seven forms of Roman government. But we could see that the reason that they were placing that as the seven heads had to do with the idea that all of the beasts, the heads are the same and the horns are the same. And we can see that that's not, that doesn't work. It's not viable. Um, and, and definitely, we couldn't apply the seven, you know, the prophetic kingdoms to pagan Rome. We can to papal Rome, which is what we're going to look at next. Okay, so does that clear up things for people as far as what we've done here with Revelation 12? And what we're trying to do. It's not totally clear, but it's providing elements for consideration. So now we're going to look at uh, the leopard-like beast, which is papal Rome. So this is a new slide. Uh, leopard-like beast, papal Rome. So obviously this is all gonna change this diagram, uh, but at least I got a nice template there to work with. Now this becomes a little more, uh, it's, it's gonna cover a broader range of time. So we know that the seven heads are going to represent Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So, um, and pagan and papal. So we're just going to get rid of this. Um, we're going to have Babylon. We're going to put the years in there. And I still haven't. Um, um, we'll call it seven uh, heads. Okay, so that has seven heads. So we got Babylon. And and we're going to put the dates in here, and I still need to do the dates in uh, 
all of these emperors as well. So I forgot about that. So we got Babylon. Babylon's going to be counted from 677 to um, 539. Now, why do we count Babylon from 677? Because the Neo-Babylonian Empire doesn't start in 677. So why do we count Babylon from 677? Because of the taking of Manasseh. Right. He's going to be carried to Babylon. When Esher Hayden is the king of Assyria, he's also, at that time, has united the kingdom with Babylon. Babylon is, is going to be a temporary capital, and he's going to carry Manasseh to his temporary capital in Babylon, even though he's the king of Assyria. So it's not really the Neo-Babylonian Empire um, that's there. And then, um, so, so you just have that short time that these, these are united. And that's one of the reasons we know, based on what Spirit of Prophecy says, she definitely, Elamite definitely believes that uh, this is uh, the captivity of Manasseh by Esar Hayden. Uh, because it's the only time you can say that uh, Babylon is the temporary capital of Assyria. And so people who try to say that it's not in the time of Esser Hayden, they have to, they're contradicting the spirit of prophecy. And, and so, so Babylon comes into his, when it comes into contact with God's people, it's the city of Babylon here. It's not really the Neo-Babylonian empire, but we still mark it as 677. That's what Uriah Smith did. That's what the charts do. We're accepting that. And Babylon is going to fall in 539. And then you're going to have um, Medo-Persia. Medo of course, it's going to become the Persian Empire. But we would just count it from 539 to... What is it? Three. What is it? Three. Three thirty-two. Is that where we mark it, or where do we mark it? Three thirty, or or three something. Three thirty-two. Okay. Yeah, so okay. So three thirty-two, and that's because and I don't know why I put the dash there. So five thirty-nine to three thirty-two, and that's going to be. Uh, that's when Greece comes into. The prophecy. Okay. And then we're going to have, of course, Greece from 332 to when? So this becomes a bit of a tricky bit because we know that it's going to be understood. Uh, on the charts, basically, Greece is dominating into 158. So that's when when Miller is going to say that Rome comes into history with the league with the Jews. Is that what we would do? Would we just use that idea? One fifty. Do we just say one fifty eight, or do we have I, a way of marking that? Well, Miller said one fifty eight. Smith tried to say it was three years earlier in one sixty one. Yeah, but and I would I would prefer using Miller's over Smith's. Okay, but what about sixty three? When Pompey conquered Syria. Um, well, no, 63B is the siege of, of Jerusalem by, by Rome. But you've also got 63 BC. That's what I said, 63 BC. The siege of Jerusalem by Rome is 63 BC, isn't it? No. Wrong? Did I do that wrong? Did I type it 63 in 63 AD was the siege of Rome. No, that's, no. You're thinking, I'm talking about when Rome conquered Jerusalem. 
Rome conquered all of Syria in 63 BC. So it was the entire, um, I don't know how to say it, but Koli Syria. Right. But Syria. they're going to, yeah, but they're going to conquer Jerusalem. So you're just saying that it's going to be, you're looking at, at when they conquer Syria, not when they conquer Jerusalem, even right. though they're in Jerusalem. Yeah, the, the Jews look to enter into the league with Rome, and that was technically Rome's first real contact with the people of God. In 63? No, in 158. Yeah, but 158. Greece, is still, all I'm saying is Greece is still in control of Jerusalem all the way until 129, 128. That's the difficulty in what we're what we're dealing with right now, because the manner in which this was being addressed before was that these nations come on the stage when they have come into contact with God's people. I understand. Right. So I know that. But all I'm saying is that Greece itself is still in control of Jerusalem, even right. though even though they come into contact with Rome, I'm just saying, do we look at when Greece no longer has control of Jerusalem? Or do we look at, or because we can mark Rome starting in 158 if we wanted to. So, I mean, the thing is, we understand the dates. Correct. I don't know if it, the reason why Miller has the 158, because that has to do with the 666 years. But it's not necessarily the best date as far as understanding when Greece no longer is in control of Jerusalem. Because even though they make this league with Rome, they're, they're still in control by, by Greece. They're still part of the Hellenistic Empire. Until until they get independence in 128, 129, 128. Right. So, so I mean, you could, but we could, you know, because nothing happens in relationship to Greece in 158. Their relationship with Greece isn't changed in any way. So, you know, so I would I would tend to put 129 BC. That's what I would put for Greece. Well, and then I would put Rome, but because I'm looking at the time in which uh, which Greece is ruling Jerusalem. Now Rome comes into contact 158, right? And then that's going to be till when we would normally go if we're going to use 158, then we have to go to 508, right? For, for pagan realm, right? So this right. is gonna be, And then you're gonna have 30 years in between that, and then you have papal realm. So I, I'm just being, you know, kind of particular about how I'm looking at this. And then that's gonna be the 12, well, not 1260, it's gonna be 1798. Right. So we would have this BC date, I guess I should put that as. And, right. So that's going to be uh, a 666 years of Miller. Because that's how Miller marked it for pagan Rome. And then he's going to have this 30 year period in between. And then Papal Rome from 538. He's not going to mark Papal Rome from 508. So there's these periods in between. Um, if we look at when Greece, well, you know, you're going to have an overlap. And then you're going to have this period in between. We understand the dates, right? We understand that it's not just, you know, one kingdom ends and another kingdom begins. Um, so it depends what it is we're looking at. So 
So then we're going to have uh, the USA. And that's going to be from 1798 to when? How would we, we put that there? We don't need a year, do we? I don't think we need a year at this point. Okay. Because we would normally yeah, we mark. Normally... Yeah. Yeah, just say the Sunday law. Right. So we just put the Sunday law. Right. So we put to the Sunday law. And then we're going to have the UN. That's going to be at the Sunday law as well. Right. So if we take this of this idea here of the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 13, I'm going to get, on a, I got to do something here I should have done before. Um, I should have saved that page. Just hang on a second and see how far I can go back. Uh, if I can go back all the way. No, I can't. Um, yeah, because I... Uh, With Babylon, will we not mark 609? No, because we're marking what... Um, we're marking 677 because of... Um, Manasseh going into captivity. Yeah, because that's when it comes into history. So it's not the Neo-Babylonian Empire that we're talking about when it comes to... Um, comes to this, so sorry about that. Sharing has stopped. Yes, the sharing is stopped because I closed the program. Open it up again. Right, so you understand. I mean, yeah. So we it depends how we want to look at it. So we've decided to look at it in the context of. Um, sort of the kingdoms coming into power. So maybe I should be more consistent. Maybe I'm not consistent enough, I guess. Anyways, sorry, I had to close this program. Now it's not responding. Do this again. It's just I have to duplicate this slide, so I have to change all that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no, it didn't allow me to do. Did it allow me to? Okay. Anyway, I have to go back and fix that later. Okay, so um, so yeah, so obviously Babylon begins neo the neo Babylonian Empire in the sense that it it is a, dealing with the, the domination over the Levant. That's going to be in six oh nine. So there's going to be seventy years. But we know Babylon comes into Bible prophecy in 677 when Manasseh is carried there. And so we have a very similar thing that happens with pagan Rome, right? We have the league with the Jews, which brings Rome into Bible prophecy. But, but Rome itself doesn't conquer Jerusalem until 63 BC. Right? So it's just this. The way that we look at, at Bible prophecy, when we look at it from prophetic or from just a historic point, they don't always match up. Like the fall of the Ottoman Empire. It's going to be in you know, the 1920s, um, but we place it in 1840. And that's because prophetically, the, the prophecy is fulfilled in 1840. Kingdoms don't just fall in a day, generally. There's a period of time in which they fall. Rome has this progressive fall, 
Jerusalem, even with the captivity. You know, I'm having a discussion with the guy about the 70 years. And he just wants to have this clean cut. You know, the captivity starts, everybody's taken captive. And then 70 years later, they're all released from captivity. He doesn't want to have any progressive captivity going on. So he's got to create this whole chronology where he can then create 70 years from the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when the last people are taken captive, to the first year of Cyrus, when the captivity ends. Right. So he's got to manufacture some bizarre chronology to do that. Um, so, you know, so we know that it's not as clear cut as that. So whether we, we put other dates on there, we would just be talking about some different event. Right. But as far as the seven heads in Bible prophecy, we can see that Greece and pagan Rome overlap. So I just put Greece to 129. But it, because I don't see anything about Greece that happens in 158. That's all I'm saying. Now, sure, Rome is now uh, the protectorate, in a sense, of the Jews, and they react in 158 BC to the, to the league they made three years earlier. And then, but that's going to count 666 years to 508. Well, uh, William Miller, he identifies that uh, there was an issue with Greece and the Jews. But the Jews, sorry, Greece backed off because of the league. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So he has Greece backing off. But still, they're under control of Greece until 129. Right? Whether whether yeah. Mill did that or not. That's all I'm saying. So yeah, I mean, if we wanted to, we could put 158 here. So let, let's just keep Miller's dates. But as long as we understand what we're doing, right? So this is how Miller would look at it all the way up to Papal Rome. Okay. And then he didn't he wouldn't understand USA and the UN in this way, right? As part of the heads. But the kingdoms themselves, he would look at that way, all the way up to pagan and papal Rome. So we know the United States is the sixth head of the beast of Revelation 13. This is what Uriah Smith is arguing against. And the reason he argues against it is because. He thinks that the heads are the same in all of the beasts. And, and we've come to the, to the view that it doesn't, doesn't make sense that they're the same in each of the beasts because they're different beasts. So in the leopard-like beast, it has all of the character, characteristics of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And, and then he says, well, it would be redundant to have the heads represent the same thing. But that doesn't make sense. I mean... The, head is, the heads are going to differentiate these different periods and include, because this, the fourth kingdom, there's only four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but the fourth kingdom has these divisions. First, you're going to have pagan and papal Rome. And then papal Rome is going to be taken away for the years of one king, 70 years as a symbol, right? Tyre. And then it's going to sing as a harlot, right? So the USA, that's the 70 years, the days of one king. And then the United Nations, these are going to be the 10 horns in the East of Revelation 17. But here that's just represented as a head, right? And they're going to be united. That's going to be Babylon, the threefold union. Pagan Rome is not part of that threefold union. Papal Rome is. So when we look at this, um, we can see that each of these heads represents uh, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon power, the UN, is really a continuation, if you want to say it, of pagan Rome in some ways. Right? It's paganism. It's secularism, it's atheism, it's, it's opposed to God, 
right? And, and the United States is the false prophet. And papal Rome, of course, is the beast, right? Because that's the beast in Revelation 13 that is the papal beast. So when we look at this here, we now have to, to say, how are we going to place this on a line? Um, just like the seven heads themselves. Are we going to go through and, and just simply do something like this, where we go uh, 677 BC, 539, 332, 158, 508, 80, 1798. Oh, we don't need the 80. And then we have to decide, you know, what this is. Is this just, we just put the Sunday law in here. How do we do this, right? So, so would we do that? And then we would just put these kingdoms here. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome, Pagan, Rome. Uh, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Pagan, Rome, Papal, Rome, the U.S., Is that how we would do it? Of course, we get rid of this, all this stuff here. That would change. So at the Sunday lot, so if we did this, um, I'm just going to do it like this. Um, I don't know if this is the easiest way to do this. Okay, so we got Babylon. Any comments on what I'm doing here? Putting these kingdoms in this order. Not yet. Yeah. So we put them in here, Greece. So if we put these here, like this, and, and then this will be supposed to probation. Okay, so there we have these kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, 
Papal Rome, USA, and the UN. Okay. Now, if we do it this way, so this is just me trying something out. Um, we can see we have a, a broader span, but we're saying that this leopard-like beast, which is going to be Papal Rome, so it's going to be this, this kingdom here from 508, and I guess, you know, we put 508, but we're going to say 508 to 1798, so it's 1290. Okay, well, that's what we're going to have here. So we're probably going to do this way, 508. So we're going to change this to 508. So technically the papacy is not set on the throne of earth till, the earth till 538. But Clovis is baptized December 25th, 508. So it it's part of the process of the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. We could put 508 to 538. But anyway... This is the leopard-like beast. The beast that's being represented is this fifth kingdom, this second part of Rome, because Rome is the final kingdom. Really, all of this last part is, is Rome, right? Pagan Rome, Papal Rome, USA, UN, they're all Rome. Right? So because Rome is that that fourth kingdom. It's it's dis differentiated. There's more detail here than what we would have in in Daniel two or Daniel seven. We could just say this is all Rome. But the beast itself, the leopard like beast, is represent is papal Rome. But we're saying papal Rome has all of these characteristics of these kingdoms. So in papal Rome is Babylon, is Medo Persia, is Greece, is pagan Rome, right? That is paganism, right? So, you know, we, we would look here, we would just say this is paganism. Right, so you have paganism, which is this, the first of the desolating powers. And then you have Rome, you have Papal Rome, right, and pagan Rome together as Rome. And then we have to look at these ten horns in this in this beast. And so the ten horns we normally would recognize as the ten nations in this one, uh, the ten nations of Europe, right? Now, Stephen did a study on these ten horns. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that study in, in a minute, but so we have the seven heads, they represent this whole span of time as far as characteristics, but they're all tied up in papal Rome. Does this make sense? So this is the view that we hold, right? The ten horns are the ten nations of Europe, the ten heads are these seven kingdoms. Do we have any problem with it? I think has it? been the established Advent is free. Okay. Well, yes, I wouldn't say for, for most of for most of it, you know. Yeah. yeah, most of it. Yeah. Adventists would put uh communism from 1798 you know, or spiritualism, and then they put the seventh kingdom as the United States. Uh, only this movement, as far as I know, uh, puts USA as the sixth and the UN as the seventh. But, but yeah, so the basic idea is pretty much understood within Adventism over the last 50 years. Right? So, Is there any problems with this? I, obviously, I got to get rid of these seven kings here at the beginning. Now, 
Now, when we deal with this, um, there are parallels. We parallel Babylon with Papal Rome, Medo-Persia with the United States, and Greece with the UN. Now, this is an important point because when we talk about all of these kingdoms and we say, well, this is this leopard-like beast, it's this composite beast, the syncretistic animal, that it's combined all of these nations, we can see that there is um, these last parts are really repetitions of the first parts. Does, does that make sense, what I just said? That we can put down here, Papal Rome, or the papacy, lines up with Babylon. And that Media Persia lines up with the USA. And that Greece lines up with the UN. That makes sense. Okay. So we can see why these other heads at the end are part of Papal Rome. That is, Papal Rome ties together the past and also it ties the past with the future, right? And so, obviously, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, parallels Babylon. It's spiritual Babylon. It parallels with literal Babylon. And then, obviously, Media Persia, we've, we've seen the parallel with the United States, the Constitution, the Law of the Medes and the Persians, the two-horn aspect of Media Persia, the two-horned beast of Revelation 13. Right. Now, another way that we could look at this is um, the woman riding the beast. Right. So this is this papacy is the woman riding the beast of Revelation 17. This the United States is uh, the two horned beast of Revelation 13. I think it also we can say that it's connected to. The, the seven kings that it talks about in Revelation 17. And the UN would be related to the ten horns, right? So the papacy is this, this woman riding this beast. That's the woman is the papacy, but it's the beast, right? So another way that we would look at this is we would say that this is the beast, This is the false prophet. And this is the dragon power. Right? Now, now the bat dragon power is pagan Rome. You know, it's the great red dragon. Okay. Um, in Revelation 12. But we can see how pagan Rome and Greece are tied together in that way as that symbol. So we're going to say it's the dragon power, but it's 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 globalism as well. And be consistent. Um So the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, we can see how they're represented there. That should be, uh, I think, clear. So when you have papal Rome, it's Rome, right? So pagan Rome and papal Rome are both Rome. But papal Rome is, you know, the, the counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary, pagan Rome, the counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. And then papal Rome is followed by the U.S. and the U.N., but those are all paralleling. That is, Papal Rome is paralleling Babylon, U.S. paralleling Medo-Persia, and the U.N. paralleling Greece. 
And so we can see why this beast of Revelation 13, this leopard-like beast, has these seven heads. Does that, does that make sense to people? Does this help people to understand why we hold this view? And that it's consistent. Now, we know that there is 10 horns. Now, these 10 horns, we, we often when you see them, um, the 10 horns, they're going to be placed upon uh, the head. Um, so you'll see different things. So in, in Papal Rome on the 1843 chart, uh, they put the, the horns on different heads. Right. But I have seen where people put all 10 horns on the on the head that is the papacy. Right. It doesn't say that the horns are distributed among the heads. It just says it has 10 horns. It doesn't say which heads have horns. Right. But papal Rome itself, and, and I don't know if it matters, but 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 the point is some people people put all 10 horns on one hand but but this is papal rome and it has all of these different aspects of these different powers and those 10 horns must be um the 10 tribes right so we're going to look at that or the 10 divisions so we're going to look at this a little bit in steven's paper here so i have to bring that up just hang on Okay, so so Stephen did this paper back. Um, this would have been twenty twenty two, right? I think it's uh, October tenth, twenty twenty two, or something like that. Or is it twenty twenty one? Can't remember. Do you remember Stephen when you did this? Um, it's been. No, not really. Probably, it feels as if it's maybe two years. Probably at least two years ago. Yeah, let me see. Um, yeah, I have it dated. It was created October tenth, twenty twenty one. So. Um, that was exactly two years ago today. Okay. So, so here we have uh, this, and, and this is from the chart. So he's doing a study on Daniel 7 on the 1843 chart. And uh, they have on the 1843 chart these dates uh, for the different kingdoms that they believe that this um and this would be the 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 parts of the feet right is that how they would look at this the 10 kingdoms they're going to take the feet and label them the 10 kingdoms and then they're going to divide up these feet or are they the toes themselves maybe they're the toes themselves I, no yeah. as uh if you look at the Lombards, it has about four toes in it. So oh. it's just a it's just a division of the feet and the toes of the image. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So how do you get that the Lombards have four toes just because of the picture? The foot is cut up. Yes. Yes. They're not, they're not taking these here kingdoms as toes. They're just saying they're, they're part of 
the feet and tools of the image. Okay. Yeah, and then they, yeah, and you didn't put the Lombards, are they in this picture? Oh, yeah, down at the bottom there. Yeah, so they just took the feet and cut them up into pieces and then gave the names and dates to them. Okay, so not sure what that, that means particularly, but it's the feet of the image being divided up. Now, we know that these dates, a lot of them don't make sense, right, Stephen? Um, According well, to your picture, some, they they can be it's a bit subjective. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I did. I can't really much remember much, but there was some that had some issues. I think with some of the dates. Yeah. Now I did send out a copy of this paper in my emails. So if somebody needs it and doesn't have it, like if I don't have your email address, you can always email me. You can also see it on my um, academia page. I, I posted it there. Um, yeah, so you're going to have these, and, and he's going to spend time analyzing these dates and the arguments of A.T. Jones. Um, but, you know, the dates that Miller got, we're not really sure exactly. Um, I mean, we know where he got some of them, but how he made decisions about the dates, we don't know his his mental process, or whether he was, you know, absolutely established upon the dates. And one of the things about the charts, um, you know, there's nothing about these dates that we know of that are established by a Bible prophecy. My view is that they just gave the best dates that they had, right? That is, that's the idea, that they're, they're not saying that, you know, because if you have a date like 1843, that's a prophetic date, right? or 677, right? Those dates are important that they be accurate. Um, um, so, you know, there was discussion back in 2012, I think it was, maybe it was 2013, in uh, Jeff's paper talking about some of these dates and that, you know, debating these dates, saying, well, they had to have been these correct dates, some of these dates. And I think particularly uh, that was some of that had to do with 158. But but the idea was, and, and so I would disagree about the 158 date, but you know, do these dates when the figures were as God wanted them, is that referring to these dates of the 10 kingdoms? And I would just say that there's no reason that we have to, to accept those dates for these 10 kingdoms. Some of them definitely are wrong. And then there is some subjectivity to it, but there's some that just can't possibly be. I can't remember which ones they were, but if a person goes through and, and reads them. Now, so there are different views. You got Azel Lyman, Bishop Lloyd, Isaac Newton, A.T. Jones, and Bishop Newton. Um, they have a different list. Now Jones has, um, uh, he doesn't have the Huns in his list, right? He replaces them with the Alamanni. And, and they, they has his reasons for it. Now, when we have all of these different tribes, the thing is people can make cases for these different tribes but we know that three of the horns are going to be plucked up. And we, we talked about this before. Well, even though three are plucked up, they still are described as 10. Now, 10 is a symbolic number. And the question is, do we need to know exactly which of the 10 tribes and exactly the dates in order for us to establish this as truth? That is, I mean, there are dif disagreements. Um, A.T. Jones and uh, um, G.I. Butler had disagreements in the 1880 General Conference over it. Um, it wasn't something to be made a big deal about, according to the spirit of prophecy. So how do we address that? Somebody has a comment on that? Stephen, you have a comment? Yeah, I, uh, I don't think we need to be specific. 
with these dates and who's tribe, what what tribe is part of the ten. I think it's more of a, except when it comes to those who are being plucked up. Right. Then okay. we then we can be specific, but considering considering the ten, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's the uh, it's that important. Yeah, and then we also recognize that there is. These ten horns, these ten horns have ten crowns upon their heads. So these are referring not necessarily to the tribes that come in and conquer, but to the nation of Europe itself as ten divisions in, in the end. Right? I mean, because how would we divide up the ten nations of Europe? I mean, are there ten nations? And how do you decide, decide what a nation is? See, um, there was a lot more tribes that could have been added to the list. Right. The Rugai, there's not all these, are, there's a list of maybe, you could have had maybe like 15 tribes being mentioned. If you're going to say well, how, how many tribes actually did come in and right. take Western Rome. Yeah, so so if you're going to take these 10, you know, you're going to say, because 10 is a symbolic number of the world, right? And so we can see that these 10 horns in the Beast of Revelation 13 are not necessarily the same as the ten horns in the beast of Daniel 7. Could we say that? That Daniel 7 is describing something different than Daniel or than Revelation 13 is. You understand what I'm saying? Because so let's let's look at this here a little bit. Um, so we know we have the ten toes, right? So that's that's Daniel chapter two. Now, part of the problem that we would have with the ten toes in Daniel chapter two is this is not necessarily describing um, the time of the papacy, right? This is describing the end of the world, right? Because this was this whole issue with with um, Jeff's paper on Daniel chapter 2 is that he's going to say that Daniel chapter 2 is fulfilled one is he's going to have it fulfilled in the time of Christ but he's going to have it fulfilled in the time of Christ as being fulfilled in the time of pagan Rome and he's going to have uh, the churches mixed in there because he's he's going to take all of these other visions and basically read back into Daniel chapter 2 details that aren't in Daniel chapter 2. So in Jan Daniel chapter 2, if we go there, just to review that first before we go to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 2, we can see that um, when he interprets the dream, you have this, this church and state. Ellen White says it's church craft and statecraft. So can you place, place church craft and statecraft in the time of pagan Rome. Well, you can, because that's going to be under Constantine. That's the first Sunday law. And, and then it says, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. And now, now it talks about the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay. So, that would be at the very end of time. We're not going to place that as happening in the time of Christ. And, and you can't have this being in pagan Rome when actually, you know, you have the ten horns in, in uh, Revelation 13 as being pap the, the kings in the time of papal Rome. Because in the time of papal Rome, they're definitely not the same tribes, the same ten tribes that ended up conquering uh, pagan Rome or the Western Roman Empire, right? So you see the problem. The problem here is that the toes, 
they are going to be at the end of the world. When the stone smites the foot of the image, it's at the end of the world. So if that's the case, if we're going to take that position, we would have to say on the 1843 chart, when it takes these toes and divides them up as these tribes that, that conquered the Western Roman Empire, that that's not really what's there at the end. It's, it's a remnant of that. That is, it comes out of that. But these tribes don't exist, you know, as 10 tribes in, in, in Europe. And definitely what's happening is the whole world is being destroyed, not just Europe. Right. I know I never said any of that very well. Would you see the problem here? Right. That we have these 10 toes and it doesn't even mention 10 here. Right. We, we're just reading into the fact that, you know, most people have 10 toes. I mean, I know a guy with 12, but, um, you know, 10 toes, that's usually what people have. And, and there is uh, in the Bible, I believe, where they have extra toes, some people, some giants. Um, so when we get to Daniel chapter seven, it's going to now talk about 10 horns and it's going to talk about the fourth beast. So it doesn't differentiate this beast, right? It's just the fourth beast. And so that has to be pagan and papal Rome. Now, of course, there's going to be these 10 horns and then three are going to be plucked up and then, um, by so it says the 10 horns of this kingdom verse 24 are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them so there is a sense an 11th horn right he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings so when it says he's diverse from the first the first what What is he diverse from? I thought it was the first three beasts. Well, it wouldn't be the first three beasts. I mean, that if it says from the first, it would just be the first beast. Or the first, you can't, because it doesn't say from, I mean, normally I'm just saying, if you're saying from the first, you're always referring to the first, not the second and the third. I'm just saying in normal English. Now, if we go back to the vision itself, so um, let me see here. So it says the fourth beast is diverse from all the others, right? So, so we have this other diverse. These great beasts are four. So let's just read this whole thing. These great beasts, which are four, there's four beasts, are four kings, which we take as kingdoms, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. So, so this fourth beast, which is diverse, um, right, it's going to say of that beast, uh, and I saw in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, is verse 7. I'm just reading that. Uh, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So here... This fourth beast is diverse from the first three beasts, right? But then it says, um, and, and so in verse 19, it says that the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others. But now when we're going to look at, um, uh, where was this here? Uh, in verse 24, the 10 horns out of the kingdom are 10 kings. So then this is talking about the 10 horns. It's not talking about the beasts, right? It's talking about the fourth beast, 
right? It's the fourth kingdom. And then it talks about 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. So from the first what? It would either be the first horn, which I don't think would make sense. So what would the first be diverse from? So he's going to be diverse. So remember, the fourth beast is diverse. But also this one is diverse. And diverse from what? How can we decide what he's diverse from? So here is what uh, the translator said. Um, this other beast, another beast, which shall rise after them, he shall be diverse from the first. So they say, this evidently points out the papal supremacy in every respect, diverse from the former, from which small beginnings thrust itself up among the ten kings, till at length it success successively eradicated three of them, the kingdom of the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Lombards. Okay, so what do we think of that explanation of the translators? I can make it a little bit bigger if you want to see that. <clears throat> They're going to give some different verses. They're going to give 2 Thessalonians, Daniel 11, 36, uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 3, as references, Daniel 8, verse 9 to 12, Daniel 7, 20, Daniel 7, 8. Any thoughts about what they're saying here? So if he's diverse from the first, not from comparing it with other beasts, but comparing it with its earlier history in some way. That's, that's what I get from what they're saying. From the former, either, either former Rome Right. But I don't think it would be comparing itself with um, the beast because this is Rome itself. So there's a diversity that happens within Rome itself. And that's this papacy. That is this Christianity um, clothing the paganism or paganism clothed with Christianity. <clears throat> Now, what about the list they have there of the Heruli, Ostrogoth, and Lombards? That's, we have that, um, we have a different thing listed on the 1843 chart. On the 1843 chart, they have the three that are rooted up as the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Ostrogoths. <clears throat> so what do we think about that? Stephen, do you have some comments on it? Yeah, I disagree um, with the... Uh, I, I think the Vandals should be there. Yeah, the Vandals should be there. Yeah, instead of the Lombards. Uh, yes, and, and the Lombards shouldn't be there. Yeah, the Lombards shouldn't be there. Now they have, um, yeah, so we should have the Vandals and they have um, the, Hru yeah, so you would just switch that. So they have the Heruli and the Ostrogoths and the Lombards. We have the Heruli, Ostrogoths, Ostrogoths, Ostrogoths and, the and, and the Vandals instead of the Lombards, right? Now I'm not sure why they have the Lombards. They don't have any explanation of that. Okay. But you can see that there are differences that people have in trying to interpret this. So the exact or correct list okay. I was just looking at the comment about Rome conquering in 168. 
I don't see that on the chart, but it must be written in small print. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but but you can see here that you know there's disagreements. It's not as clear. It's not clear cut. We have on the chart a list with dates that don't really make sense. Um, we're not criticizing the chart in the sense that you know the chart is full of mistakes. That's not what we're saying. We know that. There's aspects of the chart um, that people have trouble with. We know that Ellen White says the figures were as God wanted them. Um, and when she's talking about the figures, she's talking about the numbers. We wouldn't say necessarily the dates of these tribes conquering Rome would be uh, is what she's referring to. She would be referring to uh, the big numbers on the charts which we can say we agree with. <clears throat> now, so if we look at these 10 horns and we say, well, these are the tribes that are going to be conquering Western Rome. Um, and, and, and so if we read on, it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High shall think to change times and laws. They shall be given into his hand until a time times and the dividing of time. So who's going to be given into his hand? That would be the saints of the most high, right? But judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion and consume it and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now, so even in here, um, so we can see in Daniel chapter 2, you have the toes. The toes are the image of Daniel chapter 2. The assumption made is that the toes are the same as the horns in Daniel chapter 7. And they're the same as the horns in Revelation 12, 13, and 17. That's, that's the assumption that's being made by the pioneers. They see the 10. It's always the same. Uriah Smith supports that idea. But we're saying that the 10 are a symbol. And in different visions, they represent different things. There's no reason to think that the 10 toes represent the 10 tribes because this is going to be talking about at the end of the world. It must represent the whole world. And if we have that the 10 horns represent the UN, well, the UN is definitely not the 10 divisions of Europe or, or the 10 tribes, right? Yeah. So there's... Yeah, so there's no reason to say that the ten, uh, the ten horns in Daniel seven are the same as the ten horns in Revelation thirteen. Here, these horns are talking about these tribes that come and conquer Western Roman Empire. Three of those horns are going to be uprooted by this little horn that comes out, which is going to be the papacy. So in Revelation 13, we know that these, these horns are not representing the tribes that are conquering Western Rome, but these are representing the, the nations of Western Rome in this history of the 1260 years. And those nations change a little bit here and there all through that history. There's a lot going on. It's not just that there's 10 tribes. They come in, they conquer, divide Rome up into 10 parts. And those 10 parts are static for 1260 years. And then at the end of the 1260 years, the United States rises. Like it just doesn't happen that way. And so sometimes people cr criticize these, you know, what they would call simplistic, you know, views of history but we know that if we understand this in a symbolic sense of what's being talked about that history is more complicated it's just like when uh, you see greece divided to the four winds right 
not of one of the winds comes a little horn. And, and, and we know that, well, it's, it's divided up into lots of different parts initially, and then it's kind of four, and then eventually it's going to be two, north and south, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic empires. So it's not just this really simple thing. It divides into four and then, you know, just becomes two. It's, it's way more complicated than that. So, so you know, we have this, this and, and part of the problem, I would think, is that we just see 10, it must be the same 10. We see seven, it must be the same seven. We see 70 years, it must be the same 70 years. And, and I don't think that we can do that. So if we're going to take these 10 horns on this, this beast in Revelation 13 that have 10 crowns upon their heads, Or upon the horns, and then the heads aren't going to have crowns. They're going to have names of blasphemy. And we know that this beast is the papal beast. One of the heads is going to be, as it were, wounded to death. So we know that the papacy is going to be out of the way. The United States is going to replace it, right? It's going to be the days of one king. And then, um, and then after that, we're going to see this united, all of these three at the end, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the dragon power being the seventh head, they're all going to come together and unite, right, under the Sunday law. But when we look at Revelation 13, it's, it's describing the time in which the second beast arises. So it's going to show the history of the 1260, and then it's going to show the second beast. And the second beast... I mean, he speaks as a dragon, but he's not the dragon power, right? Because he's a two-horned beast, like a lamb. This is the United States, right? He exercises all the power of the first beast before him, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. And that's going to be the role of the United States, whose deadly wound was healed. So that, that wound is healed. Um, and he does great wonders, all these different things, right? going to make an image to the beast um, and he's going to give life to the image of the beast right so he's going to make an image to the beast and then he has power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak right so that's going to be in its ecclesiastical or not ecclesiastical yeah. what's the word anyway through its legislative power it's going to speak and cause as many as that would not worship the beast and it, and of the image should be killed, right? So that's going to be the Sunday law. So that second beast is the United States, and it's going to continue to the Sunday law. And at the Sunday law, it's going to speak like a dragon. So that's going to be the UN. That's the dragon power. The, the United States is going to use the UN, the United Nations, as the dragon power. To bring all these three together, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay. So we can see how this second beast is one of the heads and how the dragon power, the UN, is also one of the heads of the first beast. Right. So we can see that consistently. Okay. So our time is almost up. So we're going to come in uh, tomorrow. We're going to finish this off and then see if we can get into Revelation 17. But what, what we should be able to see is that we have um, uh, the 10 horns and I'll, I'll clean up this chart a little bit and put some other dates in here for the, for the other chart um, before tomorrow. So is this making sense to people how we've gone through this? It works. Okay. Yeah. It. I mean, in some ways, I feel a little bit uncomfortable just saying, "Well, there's stuff on the charts that we're we're gonna we're gonna set aside and say, well, it was incomplete. They were not looking at things completely, and so somebody could say you're rejecting the pioneers and you're rejecting truths on the chart. Um. But I think it's consistent with what the pioneers were teaching. It's consistent with Miller's rules. We're just noticing things that they didn't notice. And 
and that they they just didn't see clearly. It's not like they were wrong and we're pointing out all of their faults. But somebody may still take it that way. Because I know people, it's on the charts. The pioneers said it must be true, even if they contradict themselves. It doesn't really matter because sometimes they have different dates for things. You know, what's on the chart is not necessarily what you're going to see in, in all their writings. People are going to have different opinions amongst the pioneers about some of these things. So anyway, that's where we're at for today. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, uh, we are grateful for the time that we had to study this morning. And I just pray that you can be with each person as they study individually and search out these things. Help us to trust in you and to learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Please correct us of any errors we may have um, in our understanding and help us to see these things clearly. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.